Good morning, everybody. I would like to give a very warm welcome to all of you who are joining us today from wherever you live um, around the world. Um, today, we're here to have a conversation about Azerbaijan's priorities after the Karabakh war. Um, I'm delighted that we're having this conversation this morning um, with our special guest, uh, Mr. Hikmet Hadjiev, who's the foreign policy advisor to the president of Azerbaijan and also head of the foreign policy department at the presidential administration. Uh, so a very warm welcome to you, Hikmet. It's very nice to see you again here um, at the EPC. Um, we're going to start this uh, conversation by having a bit of an exchange between um, me and Hikmet before handing over the floor uh, to the audience. I hope that you'll all have um, many questions um, and comments. Um, just the usual housekeeping rule. You can put forward um, your questions either by clicking on the hand at the bottom of the bottom of the screen and basically saying your question verbally, or alternatively, you can click it into the question box. So as I said, I hope you're all gonna get involved uh, into this discussion. So I'd like to kick off uh, this conversation now, um, Hikmet, first of all, by, by asking you the current state of affairs on the ground. I mean, it's been more than two months since the Russian ceasefire mediated uh, agreement was signed. Can you give us an update on what's happening now? Uh, and particularly against the, the backdrop um, of the meeting that took place um, in Moscow, I think on the 11th of January, if my memory serves me correct, which was about the implementation um, of the agreement. What was the key outcome um, of this uh, event and what are the next steps going forward? Thank you, dear Amanda. It's always a pleasure to be together with an EPC. And I do regret that I'm not going to physically in EPC uh, headquarters, but looking forward for that chance as well once in a lockdown has been taken. And I'm also thankful to all participants who joined and for their interest in the uh, wider security related issues of post conflict uh, developments in the region of the South Caucasus and uh, Azerbaijan, particularly. Uh, Manda, as regards for your question, currently our focus and priority is the uh, uh, consolidation of the results uh, of the trilateral statement, political statement that have been signed on the uh, 10th of November between uh, three parties, but now Russia, Azerbaijan and Armenia, but there is a political declaration and it provides a roadmap how we can move. And deriving from that, uh, we have uh, still security related elements, but we are working on that, especially uh, building uh, uh, further our lines of communication uh, with the uh, peacekeepers and who have deployed in the certain territories of Azerbaijan and uh, further continuing our dialogue and communication and in a coordinated manner, we are building our work. Uh, yet another dimension, uh, within a practical components of our trilateral statement, uh, that's about an opening of the communication. And you are absolutely right, also mentioned 11th of January statement. Uh, that have been also uh, adopted, uh, signed uh, at the level of the uh, head of state and government of Azerbaijan, Russia, and Armenia. Here you can see it was not a political statement, it was a more practical and pragmatic uh, statement, in a sense, focusing particularly on communi opening of communication and connectivity lines. Uh, but a working group has been established. It also had its an initial uh, contacts and in a very soon uh, this working group uh, about an establishment of the line of communication will have its in a meeting at the level of the uh, deputy uh, prime ministers from three countries. Uh, specifically, it means opening of the line of communication along the uh, southern border of Azerbaijan through the deoccupied regions of Fizuli, uh, Jabrail and Zangilan and then uh, Mehri region of Armenia, then entering the Nakhchivan, and this uh, road will provide access for Azerbaijan to Nakhchivan. In the meantime, it's actually for the best interest of Armenia uh, as well, and first of all, because Armenia is like an oxygen for Armenians via transportation linkages, uh, and Armenia will have an access to the transportation uh, uh, infrastructure of Azerbaijan and reaching out to the Russia. Currently, Armenia's transportation uh, choices uh, are not so, uh, you know, multiple and to an extent limited because of the weather conditions and other restrictions. And therefore, it's going to be a win-win situation. It's, we do also consider it as one element of the confidence building measure in the wider region of South Caucasus. And after the 
uh, post-conflict uh, situation process. Thank you, uh, um, Hikmet. Perhaps you could just um, elaborate a bit. What will what is the actual time frame um, for the full implementation of these transport um, corridors, and when, when will the next trilateral meeting be taking place, which will sort of um, if the right word is monitor, monitor developments in this area. Mm -hmm. uh, as regards to the timetable, uh, first in the Azerbaijan segment of the railroad, and I will now focus on the railroad, first within the Azerbaijan and particularly in the occupied regions, we are trying to uh, facilitate our logistical reach and infrastructure uh, for uh, the reconstruction process in the meantime, uh, ensuring return of Azerbaijani refugees and IDPs. Therefore, uh, from Baku to up to Fizuli and Hora, this region of Azerbaijan, but was uh, under the control of Azerbaijan before 27th. Up to that point, Horadis station, we have operational uh, railway system. But from Horadis to Ahband village in Zangalan region of Azerbaijan, it was under the occupation, uh, approximately it's, you know, more than 130 kilometers. Uh, but uh, during the under the occupation, it has been completely destroyed. Now, our nationally, our priority is to build that segment of railway. It will require less than two years uh, to work on this uh, segment. And then uh, we are talking about uh, a segment within Armenia, Vatsana Mehri, and also in Nachwan uh, 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 Autonomous Republic of Azerbaijan, but we have already established railway system, and uh, it also linked uh, with the regional countries. Uh, but one of the ideas also to establish in a consortium consortium and a sense that you know uh, regional countries in the meantime international partners can also join this process if we can make it yet another success story that brings together uh, everyone as a complementary element to our uh, political initiative of establishing a regional platform of uh, regional uh, security like three plus three meaning three Caucasus countries and also three neighboring countries but it's an open-ended process for us as a partners as well. If the audience is interested, we can elaborate a little bit more on that. But of course, we, we can't and shouldn't wait just for the completion of the railway, uh, because we have a land road as well. Uh, certain uh, uh, cargoes can be brought, for example, from Baku to Horadis via the railroad, but through the trucks, it can, uh, it's, it can be provided, but it uh, goes to the final destination, and vice versa too as well certain cargoes can uh, via the trucks can come from the territory of Armenia along with line if they want to reach in a Russian market in a more efficient way in a much more speedy way we can provide them this opportunity communication is in a key fundamental issue it's also one element of building their confidence I would like to re-emphasize a key fact here building their uh, confidence building measures is wider as part of the wider this building process is extremely key and we'd like also to once again to demonstrate how the life of Armenian people or can also change for the uh, better uh, if we are going to start with elements of the cooperation in the region that Azerbaijan actively supports and will continue to support comprehensive regional cooperation process. But uh, in this uh, context, particular timelines, I have a difficulty to say, but uh, the intentions over there, uh, uh, over there and also uh, we also see that uh, this enthusiasm is also shared by other partners as well. Therefore, very soon, as indicated in the uh, trilateral statement, deputy uh, prime ministers of three countries will come together. It's going to be very soon. So it's just a matter of the days. And how would you assess the level of interest from the Armenian side um, at a business level, but other levels for establishing these sort of, you know, trade links? I mean, we know the situation in Armenia at the moment is still rather um in, in turmoil and how do you think this could you know impact this process uh in general in armenia of course uh it's an uh, azerbaijan's also views that we would like to see a stable normal relations between the republic of armenia and the republic of azerbaijan within their sovereign territories and uh, we, in that context we also wish all the best to uh republic of armenia and uh you know uh, we are also looking forward or even for the support of our international partners, uh, including the regional countries, of course, and including for the European Union, uh, but also EU basis on comparative advantage and knowledge from other regions can also contribute to this process, building the confidence between Armenia and Azerbaijan. 
and the long-term uh, perspective. Uh, and of course, in this process, uh, people-to-people -people contact is extremely important and a valuable element of building longer term and a lasting peace between two countries. Uh, internal political development, uh, because uh, we should be very realistic, bonds are too fresh in both societies, including in Azerbaijan, because recently we had a war and uh, both uh, societies have uh, casualties as a result of this war. Uh, but beyond that, of course, rational thinking should dominate and should prevail emotions. And in this uh, context, particularly, we are expecting more uh, rational thinking should prevail emotions or uh, previous uh, uh, history-based narratives uh, in Armenian society. We are seeing some elements of them. Some people are calling for the realistic assessment or reconciling with the reality instead of looking at the past, instead of uh, switching or resorting to the old narrative in Armenia. But from another side, unfortunately, we see some radical and chauvinistic elements. They are trying to uh, take the initiative on their hand and to play with the emotions of the people and to return to the old narrative. That's a particularly dangerous development. And we also see some groups uh, are calling for the revanchism. Uh, that could be yet another disaster for the wider uh, region of the Third Caucasus. In no way it's in our intention to see revanchist Armenia. Uh, but still uh, some elements uh, what we can see. And therefore, through our joint efforts, we can build regional cooperation and in inclusive process within that Armenia can also participate and Armenian can, people can also see the benefit of regional cooperation. If they see the benefit of the regional cooperation, and I believe uh, it can provide a longer term uh, basis for uh, 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 regional cooperation and uh, regional integration. And from its part, Azerbaijan you know, is ready to play its own role. Just returning back to the, the last trilateral meeting. Um, at that meeting, there was no agreement reached on prisoners of war. Um, how do you see this going forward? I mean, the exchange, what is the situation today? Uh, as regards you know, prisoners of war, immediately, as in, a, uh, in an immediate aftermath of the uh, conflict and war, uh, based on the trilateral statement, one of the elements was about in a POWs, based on the principle all to all. Uh, what we have, the num uh, Armenian soldiers, and we returned, and Armenian side also returned Azerbaijani uh, POWs. Uh, but in a sense, in a positive thing. In a sense, uh, in the meantime, we had a missing persons. Uh, missing persons, and especially uh, the bodies of uh, Armenian soldiers who have been left in the battleground. But we provided full access. It's really one of the uh, very uh, positive humanitarian uh, projects that are conducted uh, between uh, Armenia and Azerbaijan with the support of the Russian peacekeepers and ICRC. I myself was surprised when I was together with international journalists in Jabra, the region of Azerbaijan. I see what Armenian uh, officers, accompanied by Azerbaijani officers and uh, Russian peacekeepers, ICRC representatives, including family members who are searching the bodies uh, of their relatives uh, in the battleground. Because Armenian military is known better than we do, where there was a real combat operation, uh, some bodies where they lived, and so on. And from Azerbaijan's side, we provided all possibilities that we can, including logistic support for this search operation. Uh, just uh, let me provide you with one figure. As a result of the two months of extensive cooperation and a constructive engagement of Azerbaijan's side, more than 1,200, more than 1,200 bodies of Armenian soldiers had been retrieved from the battleground. We also have a missing uh, persons from Azerbaijan side, especially in Kalbajar uh, region and Murovdah region of Azerbaijan. Uh, we're also looking forward for the extensive uh, support and cooperation of Armenian side because family members are also demanding and they're absolutely right to demand uh, about the fate of their sons. Uh, but that's one element. But uh, unfortunately, what we see uh, unnecessary uh, propaganda by Armenian side with regard to uh, 60 plus Armenian soldiers, uh, but they are also trying to put it uh, like they are POWs. But let me very specific and clear on that issue. Uh, these soldiers are nationals of the Republic of Armenia, citizens of the Republic of Armenia. Their home military base was Shirak region of the Republic of Armenia. And they penetrated the territory of Azerbaijan after the 10th of November trilateral statement. In another word, after the end of the war. 
and they penetrated to that area, they started to build in a stronghold and they killed four or five Azerbaijani military officers and they killed also Azerbaijani civilians who were operators of Azerbaijan's mobile operator building antennas of that area. And what we were obliged to take within a counter-terrorist operation and to neutralize this group of people. Uh, for under the humanitarian law, international humanitarian law, and also under the laws of Azerbaijan, and uh, there should be uh, uh, different legal treatment with regard to these people. For on that context, we're also uh, in contact with the uh, Armenian side, as you know, there was in a contact through the appropriate agencies of two countries uh, that was also made in a public. But I believe it's also yet another sign of direct engagement between Baku and Yerevan. And uh, through different channels, we are also talking to our Armenian side. But this has a legal uh, case that has been open. But still, lines of communication are open on that uh, regard as well. How would you assess the, the Russian peacekeepers um, on the ground? Would you say they're able, they're, they're doing um, a good job? I mean, as you mentioned, there have been, you know, there's been a, there's been a few incidents. But I mean, overall, do you think they have the ability um, to, to, to do the job they were tasked to? in the longer term? Really, currently speaking, uh, we have an open channels of communication and coordination uh, with the peacekeepers and Russian peacekeepers who have been deployed on the territory of uh, Azerbaijan and based on the trilateral uh, statement. But for, at a practical level, as a military to military cooperation, uh, our coordination in general uh, is good. And uh, they're also trying to uh, you know, fulfill their mission in a professional manner and also talking to you know, both sides and ensuring safe passages of the civilians and the cargoes uh, from both sides and providing the uh, uh, necessary accompany uh, for the uh, militaries and civilians at the same time. Therefore, in general, uh, we have a good coordination and yet another element uh, of uh, the peacekeeping mission is in a monitoring center that has been established in Ardam region of uh, Azerbaijan uh, there, uh, both uh, Russian and uh, Turkish uh, officers uh, will sit together and uh, monitor uh, development and fulfillment and mission of peacekeeping. It's yet another, we do think, that uh, positive element in the meantime to monitor the successful uh, fulfillment of the mission of peacekeeping. In the meantime, Azerbaijan from its side provides uh, access uh, for the uh, Russian peacekeepers and says facilitates their job because they're also delivering humanitarian aid and support to uh, the Armenian uh, community uh, members of Azerbaijan and living in uh, Khan Kandy and some other cities because uh, reaching to that area is more efficient from the territory uh, of Azerbaijan. And we are coming from the north of Azerbaijan using Azerbaijan railway system and coming to Barda Ardam and from there it's in a flat road immediately reaching that. By all means, we are facilitating it. In the meantime, we opened the Ganja airport, that's also very close to that area. From Ganja airport, they're also delivering their cargoes. Otherwise, they should have an airlift and to airlift to Yerevan and from Serpanzil, watch and roll, but uh, too narrow and too risky and also takes a lot of time. So at a practical uh, level, things are going, you know, in a sense, uh, well. And most importantly, we have an, a calmness and situation in general could be considered fragile because still there are some uh, elements, but the most important thing is that now we have a stability, uh, trying to work together on the consolidating the results and indications of the trilateral statement. May I just ask you now about, about what Azerbaijan has been doing in terms of the steps towards um, reconstruction and development in the liberated territories? I know that um, the authorities have been very active um, and also perhaps in terms of bringing foreign direct investment into these to these areas. I mean, what sort of interest have you had? Is there already some sort of um, deals in the pipeline? Uh, thank you, Amanda. Really, it's a, one of the major tasks and also challenge and the meantime opportunity ahead of Azerbaijani government. Because I myself, together with the international uh, you know, partners and also you know, diplomats, journalists, and uh, NGO representatives visit with, uh, visited these they occupy territories in an extensive uh, way. But Amanda, you know, unimaginable situation on the ground. Almost everything has been destroyed. When I was a kid, I have been to Fizuli and Ardam cities of Azerbaijan in late 80s. It was in a flourishing cities of the region of Caucasus. Almost everything has been destroyed. I have never ever seen 
such a level of destruction, even the uh, whole Hollywood movies. It's even worse than the Stalingrad, really. And it's a real example of illustration of urbicide. It's like a genocide against the cities, uh, we can call it. And physically, particularly, really, it's a nature. It's a, like a zombie apocalypse sort of movie. And if someone in Azerbaijan, our, our foreign partners, I would invite them to go and visit that area. Like a nature overtaken all of his destructions. An uh, unimaginable level of destruction. Here really comes another question, and we all are trying to understand and also pose this question to Armenian side. Tell what you have achieved, except this destruction and occupation. You have been occupied with territories and you never used it. Even the buildings, every stone of the building were taken out to South Iberia, I don't know, somewhere. Therefore, destruction level is a huge. For uh, now, we are trying to prioritize and plan our action. First, in post-conflict reconstruction process, coordination, consistency, cooperation is extremely important. Internal uh, government coordination, I mean, and also coordination with the international partners. Uh, secondly, uh, we are trying to uh, identify uh, our uh, uh, work of action in a prioritized manner because we are also, as a first matter of uh, challenge, as it's also witnessed in other post-conflict situation, uh, remnants of war in terms of unexploded ordinances and mines. The area is also hugely contaminated by the uh, mines and exploded ordinances. The line of contact area and also uh, the battleground areas and also while retrieving Armenian armed forces use also mechanized the vehicles to plant a lot of mines. Uh, the mine action is going to be a huge challenge ahead of us. Uh, without mining, we cannot engage some other activities. But in the mine action, you should also prioritize IO activities. Uh, currently, we are first, our priority is to build uh, connectivity infrastructure. It's about you know, roads, railways, possibly airport, for example, in the physical region of Azerbaijan, my president uh, launched a uh, laser ground of opening of uh, airport and some other infrastructure items. And secondly, is in a uh, housing and uh, habitation uh, you know, building process and settlement for Azerbaijan IDPs because those IDPs would like to return to their homes. But before returning, we should identify the housing requirement as a number of the people. And uh, also, uh, we should also have a timeline within which framework we would like to return to IDPs and their futures. And third element, building up as a social infrastructure, schools, hospitals, and so on, because simply nothing left over there. And then employment opportunities, because we are also learning the experience from other post-conflict situations uh, as well, because there should be appropriate uh, you know, uh, employment opportunities as well. Uh, these are our priorities, and we are trying to put it in the concrete specific areas. Uh, we have established more than 17 working groups, and now we have in our headquarters uh, under presidential administration and different government institutions under the particular frameworks. Uh, working groups are came coming together. They also established in cooperation with the, uh, our international partners, including through the commercial lines as well. And now we are starting our urban planning process with a particular focus on the city of Shusha, because Shusha is something you know extraordinary in the heart of Azerbaijani people. For 30 years, we were yearning, uh, you know, waiting for the liberation of the city of Shusha, and uh, we would like to also because Shusha is also part and parcel of Azerbaijani culture and Azerbaijani civilization. And as regards to our international partners, uh, because we would like to see uh, international companies and particularly the companies from the friendly countries of Azerbaijan, including our EU partner uh, countries, to be present uh, in the uh, reconstruction process. It could be public-private partnership mechanisms as well. And uh, once our priorities are uh, ready, once our own internal program ready, we will uh, open it and we are also looking forward for investment or donor conference as well uh, for uh, the engagement of our international partners. But first we should identify our own program and then we will of course uh, having, uh, um, we will make sure that it's an open to our international partners. Of course we will need support, cooperation and partnership of our international partners through the government wise and private sector wise as well. Um, Hikmet, I don't think you mentioned it, but I believe that Azerbaijan created a special envoy um, for the liberated um, territories. Could you say something about his role? Uh, and could you also say a few words about um, what role the international organizations such as the OSCE 
um, and the United Nations we, would be able to play um, in this reconstruction process, but also um, in, in the peace process going forward. I mean, in terms of transforming the ceasefire agreement into a political settlement um, and related to that, the future status um, of, you know, that part of uh, Nagorno-Karabakh that is not yet under, or is, which is still not under Azerbaijan um, control. How do you see this? Uh, first, a special representative office or institution has been established uh, under the decree of my president. It's more about an internal administrative uh, work because uh, uh, in Azerbaijan's administrative uh, labor division system, uh, what we have is we have a mayor system, but every particular region or city has its a local executive power and is shared by uh, mayor. But uh, the situation in our uh, de occupied territories is completely different because we are starting from the scratch. It requires a uh, full coordination of the government uh, level, uh, uh, coordination of all institutions. Uh, uh, with that understanding, a uh, special representative office has been uh, you know, established with an appropriate power and responsibility so that to coordinate the work on the ground. But it's in a statute is under the development. That's in a one part uh, of the story. Uh, as regards in a uh, wider uh, political settlement process and also with regard to uh, Armenian community in Nagorno-Karabakh uh, region of Azerbaijan, uh, simply uh, we have made it very clear that we do consider them as in a citizens of Azerbaijan. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, they should also you know, respect and also accept in a constitution and the legal uh, framework of Azerbaijan. And within that process, uh, we are also you know, looking forward for future opportunities, uh, but uh, for uh, in the integration into the wider political and economic system of Azerbaijan, also to ameliorate uh, their living situation. And uh, what we have seen after this day occupation, really, the uh, local people who are living over there, they were living in a desperate situation and poverty level, it was uh, you know, one of the highest level of poverty and so on. For uh, with this uh, uh, economic uh, future uh, programs and also uh, with a better trading opportunities, we would like to integrate them uh, further in Azerbaijan's uh, economic system. As regards some, you know, political issues for us, as it was said by my president as well, uh, Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, so-called, is uh, about a history, and we would like to make sure that this region is going to be associated with a peace, development, startup coexistence, multiculturalism, and uh, some other positive things rather than a conflict. Uh, uh, simply, uh, as regards uh, to uh, 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 the political status that uh, sometimes you know, people are trying to raise this issue, because uh, we think that status issue uh, is also you know, part of the history, uh, in a sense that uh, there could be certain kind of uh, you know, uh, rule or self-rule for the Armenian community on the ground, that uh, it could be, you know, considered from that perspective. Also, we do think that European Union can help us because in EU countries, especially uh, reconciliation, post-conflict reconciliation, ethnic reconciliation process, and also confidence-building measures or community-based uh, living together approach is well developed in so many European countries. There is also historical background, especially from the Balkan region and also in the history of European countries, particularly. We can take an example of France and Germany and the ethnic reconciliation process that took place in the 50s and 60s, and it's one of the successful examples. These are the elements that we can take into consideration, but here, once again, I would like to emphasize or re-emphasize key focus should be uh, made on building confidence between the Republic of Armenia and the Republic of Azerbaijan. If we are going to establish normal relations between two countries or respecting one another, respecting one another's borders, I believe it's going to be an uh, element of the long-term security and peace in the region of uh, South Caucasus. But uh, unfortunate calls uh, for so-called uh, status of uh, status in visa in a different way. Uh, once again, I will like to reiterate that it, call, uh, it causes for creation of unnecessary expectations, and it also encourages uh, radicals, and it also, of course, irritates Azerbaijan. And uh, everybody knows that even in the mid 90s, when Azerbaijan lost the war, Azerbaijan had a non million refugees, Azerbaijan has a humanitarian catastrophe on the ground, but Azerbaijan never ever reconciled as any other country with the loss of its territory or uh, giving some uh, other 
in our status to the Nagorno-Karabakh region of Azerbaijan. Whenever it can start, we will adjust. And we were acting within the legal framework and based on the norms and principles of international law. And why we should do it now? But of course, it shouldn't come in this understanding that uh, we are denying the right for existence of Armenian community of Nagorno-Karabakh. We do respect their right. They should be proud and dignified citizens of Azerbaijan. As regards, I will let you highlight about the cultural and religious heritage in uh, Nagorno-Karabakh and the occupied regions of Azerbaijan. Among the, here, we shouldn't be selective. Really. For many years, it also hurt Azerbaijani people because we have seen our cultural heritage, our mosques, and some other religious sites have been destroyed. And by knowing that, uh, you know, uh, in, in every religion is a case, it doesn't matter if it's a synagogue, church, or mosque, putting the animals or pigs into the uh, religious site, it really hurts in the sensitivities of the people. But what we have seen it, we have seen it in Ardham Mosque. Uh, Shusha Mosque and some other mosques of Azerbaijan completely destroyed. Entire cultural heritage of Azerbaijan has been destroyed in the occupied territories with the sole understanding that to erase all trace of Azerbaijan is related to that region. It's a part of the history now, but in the meantime, these are the memories, uh, but it's never it's impossible to forget. If we're, uh, with regard to the international organizations, particularly with regard to their cultural heritage, but once again, Azerbaijan is ready and willing to restore all cultural and religious sites in the occupied territories. That's a policy of Azerbaijan. And why we should do it otherwise in our occupied territories if we are rebuilding churches or contributing to rebuilding of uh, Christian religious sites in Vatican, in Strasbourg, in Bulgaria, in many other countries as well. We do, we never talk about that, but we do consider it as part of our moral uh, obligation. Why shouldn't do it otherwise in our occupied territories? As everybody knows, in other cities of Azerbaijan, Never it's in a majority Muslim country, but the Shia Sunni mosques or church and synagogue are side by side in dignity and so on. Before we would like to apply the same philosophy of coexistence in our occupied regions. As regards to the regional organizations in general, including the UN institutions, uh, and, uh, we are also taking the lessons learned from some other post conflict situations. Maybe it sort of comes from uh, the emotional uh, attractiveness or maybe emotional approach, but in post-conflict situations, some international organizations are trying to jump uh, in that area and trying to contribute. Under such circumstances, uh, avoiding duplication of efforts and ensuring better coordination and also ensuring the fact that it's going to be in the right political context, not to uh, you know create unnecessary political expectations or provide uh, additional elements to the fuller the fragile situation on the ground. Because now we are focused on the consolidation of the results of the trilateral statement. Humanitarian advice, let's be very open on that issue. There is not going to be any sort of catastrophe, including for the Armenian community of Nagorno-Karabakh. We know the situation very well. ICRC, it's in the eyes and ears of the international community on the ground, and it's a reputable inst international institution. And it's also having a full endorsement of the government to operate in our, uh, on the entire territory of Azerbaijan, even the, since the early 90s. Under the occupation, ICRC was a sole institution that has been entitled, entitled to work in our the, uh, occupied territories. Now ICRC continues its operation, but as regard for some other UN institutions, let's be you know, once again, you know, we're going to have to shoot. some of them don't know operational situation on the ground, and uh, therefore uh, future, uh, any kind of action should be better coordinated. And also, there are some security-related issues and certain priorities uh, first. And we also, as I already told, providing full access for the Russian uh, peacekeepers, but they're also providing some humanitarian aid, even they are facilitating their job, because we know that people are living over there and to, pro to meet all their humanitarian conditions on the ground. But our future work with international institutions, we are looking forward you know, uh, to, uh, to look at uh, you know, further uh, our uh, steps. Particular OSC means group uh, process, and we are going to continue our engagement and cooperation with the OSC means group co chairs. Their work in general, of course, you know our reaction. Unfortunately, we have been never satisfied. I also had a chance to talk about their uh, you know, uh, work that uh, caused for you know, unsatisfaction of Azerbaijan, even in APC, in APC and some other institutions, because 30 years we uh, you know, waited for their uh, firm political. Uh, readiness and determination, unfortunately, never happened. Nevertheless, we already had a roadmap of resolution of the conflict. But since then, 
uh, what we are our expectation from OFC musical chairs, they should also to be ready to be adaptable to the new situations. They shouldn't uh, think about or uh, switch to the old narrative. That's going to be counterproductive, and it will also put an obstacles on our way to move forward. And OSC music group co-chairs should adapt in a sense that they should put on the table their comparative advantage. What is their comparative advantage? First, knowing situation very well, and knowing polit political sensitivities very well, and knowing all the fragility of the situation of the very well. Because many of the international institutions, they don't know such a sensitivities very well. Because situations are fragile, their engagement could cause additional difficulty rather than uh, uh, contribute to solving the problem. Our expectation is them to focus on confidence building measures. Really, we need a confidence and trust. And before it didn't work well, but now we have an excellent opportunity to have a confidence building measures between Armenia and Azerbaijan and building uh, people to people contacts uh, that OSCE uh, musical co chairs uh, can contribute in a greater sense. And as I already said, we are also looking forward to establish a regional platform of cooperation. For example, Baltic regions, with three countries after the integration of the Soviet Union, came together. They also had the differences a lot, but they came together, established you know, their regional cooperation, and then they reached to other international institutions. It also uh, was uh, much easier for our, other international institutions to work as an original group of these countries. We would like to contribute to this process. In this process of the opening of the lines of communication, of course, uh, we uh, see our strategic partner, Georgia, as an you know, very, very close apart to all of these wider processes, and also for ensuring inclusiveness uh, and further integration of Armenia under the new regional security architecture and changing geopolitical environment. And then once we are successful in our trilateral format, we can enlarge it within a trilateral format of our three big regions, like you know, uh, Turkey, Russia, and Iran, as a result of which we can have three plus three, and by doing that, we can also contribute to diffusing of tension that existing between some other, uh, some countries of the South Caucasus with their, you know, other neighbors as well. And was President uh, Erdogan also in Baku said that there could be elements or potential for normalization of relations between Turkey, Armenia as well, it's an Armenia stops this and claims as well. And Russia, Georgia uh, relations, uh, and this process we are looking forward can contribute. And it could be open-ended process, and AU, some other partners, can also contribute to this process as well, and why not, and it should be as well. Sort of hoping that's a bit long. No, that was incredibly interesting. And you just, as you just mentioned, Iran, um, I know that President Rouhani um, was in Baku just a few days ago. Maybe you could just elaborate a bit on the outcome of those meetings. Um, and what prospects you see or what the Iranians see now for their, for their co cooperation in some of these projects? Uh, just uh, one small uh, correction, Amanda. It was in a Javad Zarif, and a foreign minister of Iran uh, was in Baku. Oh, sorry. We had a, no problem, no problem. Yeah. Uh, we had an, uh, our uh, discussion, and actually it's a regional tour uh, by Iranian foreign minister. He will with Azerbaijan, and it's in a next leg of stop going to be Russia, uh, Turkey, uh, Armenia, and Georgia. Simply, it will make an, a tour along with a concept of three plus three. Uh, in that context, uh, we also see Iran as a neighboring country. Iran is a neighboring Azerbaijan and Armenia. We also have our own historical relations and ties uh, with Iran. And uh, we also do expect that there will be some more engagement uh, with the uh, uh, Iran and the new administration of the United States. But it's a bilateral agenda. Let's hope for that as well. That could also add some uh, predictability. And in our concept or our vision of three plus three, we are also seeing Iran along with the Turkey, Russia, and uh, uh, along with the Turkey and Russia to be part of this process of uh, regional uh, security and cooperation platform. In other words, we can call it even South Caucasus Stability Pact project, even or we can call it Pax Caucasia, as you name it. Uh, we can name it in a different ways. And of course, we would like to see Iran as a part of this process. And Iran, based on the knowledge, capabilities, and also expertise, can also contribute specifically in the reconstruction of some of our uh, destroyed uh, regions. Uh, Iran is geographically very close. Some of the Iranian companies could also be uh, part of this process. Also, wider connectivity lines. If we will manage to build this connectivity line that passes through 
uh, 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 the regions of Azerbaijan, Fizuli, Jambrail, Zengilan, it will go to Mehri and from Mehri to Nakhchivan, and from Nakhchivan it's going to be linked with the Iranian railway system, by, by the way, and uh, during the Soviet time with railway system and connecting Soviet Union with Iran wasn't operational, but simply we can uh, restore it, and it also means that by doing that, Armenia also becomes part of the Iranian own railway system and can uh, ship its in a cargo to the Persian Gulf region, for example. And uh, you know some other elements are true as well. Or we see Iran as a regional country as part of this process. Okay, thanks, um, Hikmet. I'm now going to um, put to you some of the questions that we've had come in. Um, the first one I'm going to read out, it's from Roxana Christescu. Um, from CMI, and she's asking, if you were to advise the EU on a South Caucasus regional strategy, what would you say the priority should be? How should the EU boost its role? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, as regards to the European Union, if you take it on a bilateral basis, almost three countries of the region of South Caucasus have their good bilateral relation uh, with the European Union, and all of these countries are also part of the Eastern Partnership Mechanism. Within the Eastern Partnership, one of the major focus was always to uh, promote uh, regional cooperation. Unfortunately, the South Caucasus, because of the war, has been so fragmented that we didn't have a proper regional cooperation. Now, you see that Azerbaijan uh, is in the position of trying to be the champion of the regional cooperation in the region of the South Caucasus. And here I see really comparative advantage or in the future, uh, element of future effective cooperation of the European Union or contribution of the European Union uh, to the peace and security in the region of uh, South Caucasus. But within the Eastern Partnerships, there are a lot of instruments that can contribute. And by doing that, EU can also contribute building of stable relations uh, between uh, the three countries and can support our regional cooperation uh, initiatives, either in a bilateral way or through the Eastern Partnership uh, mechanisms as well. In the meantime, as I already, as I already said, EU has an, a vast uh, experience of post-conflict re uh, reconstruction and rebuilding. Because multiple R's, reconstruction, rebuilding, rehabilitation, and so on, it's going to be cash words for Azerbaijan in the upcoming years because we are also facing this reconstruction. EU countries, the European Union, including the EU uh, you know, institutions and also private companies from the EU countries can also be uh, part of this process. And also ethnic reconciliation uh, and uh, also ethnic reconciliation gonna be one of the key element of long-term and durable peace and security and EU basis in a Balkan experience and also basis on experience uh, can contribute because in general philosophy of the European Union is in a post world war uh, Europe that has been fragmented but has been destroyed there was an enmity and a hostility but Europe based on economic cooperation based on trading managed to build such a success story. For based on such an experience, you, I believe, have an, a lot of instruments can contribute. But unfortunately, what we see again in the European Parliament, still there are some political groups are trying to politicize say, all of this development. And instead of perhaps contributing or supporting us, they are uh, actually encouraging destructive forces and radical forces, and including the chauvinistic elements still we see uh, in the region and by uh, unilateral statements and declarations that are completely counterproductive are not helping for the peace and uh, therefore uh, it's our also our message that instead of doing such things they can effectively contribute to the peace building process thank you i have a question here from vaido Holodja. i hope i pronounced that correctly um, he's asking, what is the future of property rights and their protection in the newly regained, gained areas? You know, we're uh, an actual occupied territories and actually uh, almost 100 percent or 99 percent of the population were Azerbaijanis. And actually, never ever Armenians lived in those areas. If you take Ardam, Jabrail, Fizuli, Kubatli and Lachan and these regions of Azerbaijan. And 30 years the entire property of Azerbaijani population we are talking about in this region, more than 700 at that time. Now the number is you know, increased due to demographic development and all entire their property has been destroyed. Now, 
if you ask me, and legally speaking, of course, Azerbaijan also has a right to demand with a restitution from Armenian side because under the occupation, Armenia has destroyed all public, private, and state property in the occupied territories of Azerbaijan, along with the old cultural heritage. Here we have a tangible and intangible heritage. Some of the things that we can restore, but some of the things have gone. For example, cultural, historical cultural heritage. We will not be able to restore them. Some of them are completely erased and environmental damages and so on. There are a lot of damages uh, had been caused. Therefore, now Azerbaijan, uh, by its own financial resources, going to be rebuilt uh, in all of these uh, areas. In the meantime, still, we have regions of Azerbaijan. Once we are talking about the return of IDPs, we should also ensure a return of Azerbaijani IDPs to, for example, Khan Kandy. Still, we have a substantial number of Azerbaijanis who are originally from Khan Kandy and from Askeran. Uh, from Khojavan and some other regions as well. They also have a right uh, for property that has been denied. And uh, these are issues that should be uh, considered in a comprehensive way. Thank you. Um, now I have um, a question, who, a hand up um, from Susanna Marazuela. So I hope my colleague, um, Natalie, can you um, unmute Susanna, please? Susanna? I didn't want to no? interrupt any mistake. Sorry. Okay, in the... um, okay, then, Susanna, you're not there? Okay, then uh, there's another hand up from Yuri Shiko. Uh, hello? Okay. Yeah. Oh, great. Uh, Go ahead. Thank you very much for uh, for providing the possibility to ask question. So, Mr. Hajiv, you were talking quite a lot about uh, the desire for confidence building measures between Azerbaijan and Armenia. And uh, I have a question to this, because uh, if um, uh, if uh, it is, if your government intends to build confidence with Armenia, but we know that uh, after the war, uh, some parts uh, that Azerbaijan uh, sees as its territory, they are not under Azerbaijani control now. So um, the, my question is, uh, can you say that uh, uh, Azerbaijan won't use, will abstain from using any military force or any other force to try to bring back uh, uh, these territories under its control. Because if there is this uh, danger or risk of renewal war and military conflict, uh, there could be no confidence measures. Um, Mr. Sheiko, thank you uh, for your question and actually uh, you see that in the course of the military operation, Azerbaijan once again demonstrated its strategic passions, and Azerbaijan also, uh, you know, uh, tried to win a peace as well. Because you kind of win a war, but it's always, you know, much more important to win a peace. But our intention was uh, to win a peace. That's an intention. And you know, legally speaking, uh, the course of the military operation, see, Azerbaijan, uh, uh, you know, conducted uh, and operated within the uh, frameworks of the international law and in the sovereign territory of Azerbaijan. And, uh, you know, it was a peace enforcement operation to bring Armenia to the uh, negotiation table in response to the provocations of Armenian side. As regards to the areas of Azerbaijan, to really call it politically correct, I would uh, switch to the terminology, uh, territories of Azerbaijan uh, where peacekeepers are deployed uh, or peacekeepers deployed uh, territories of Azerbaijan. And we saw the areas, and I believe with the elements of the soft power and a smart power, with the engagement and community-based approach, we are looking forward for the integration of that areas into the political, economic, and wider so uh, social system of Azerbaijan. And that's an, our intention. As regards to our bilateral relations between Armenia and Azerbaijan, it's Azerbaijan's view to see that, not to see revanchist Armenia once again. It's our stronger view. And also here, international institutions, including the EU, can also help us, but a uh, wider region, including the help to Armenian side, not to challenge with trilateral statement, not to challenge its in a result. It's going to be yet another disaster for the wider region. It's not an intention of Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan ensured the occupation of territories. We are working about you know, reconstruction. They are talking about you know, rebuilding. That's a major issue, challenge, and priority of Azerbaijan. 
we're talking about an opening of the lines of communication. So we're taking as a, some of the initiatives on our hand. We are looking forward for this trilateral meeting of the three countries of the region of the South Caucasus. These other initiatives are coming from Azerbaijan, but of course, we also expecting some reciprocity from Armenian side. Also, we also understand that some emotions, some bounds of fresh in both societies. So it should be gradual, step-by-step -step, uh, approach of building uh, the uh, conference. And also, Armenian uh, community living in Nagorno-Karabakh region of Azerbaijan, economically speaking, what we are seeing the real ground of the situation, they have, uh, they are living in utmost poverty. They, for 30 years of occupation, really did bring nothing to Armenia. They just spared their own resources, and they also caused so much difficulties and challenges and casualties to Azerbaijan. Once again, this question, Armenian side, what you have achieved as a result of this occupation? And cost of occupation was extremely high. And they have built with a huge fortification systems. It was militarily difficult to overpass it. And they built a huge uh, uh, kind of fleet of tanks and artillery systems. In a small territory of Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, Armenian armed forces built a fleet of more than 300 tanks and hundreds of different uh, you know, armed personal vehicles. These are a lot of money, but they could have spent it to uh, some other uh, in a positive way. But now, let's not turn the page. That's an intention of Azerbaijan in a peaceful manner to reconstruct the region and to ensure inclusi inclusivity and integrity, and including the Armenian uh, community of Nagorno-Karabakh. Okay, I have a question here from William um, Lavender from European Friends of uh, Armenia. Um, and he's coming back to a topic that you touched on before. Um, and he's asking uh, about the unexplained delay in returning all Armenia um, POWs uh, and also why uh, President Aliyev has branded some of them as um, terrorists. You know, first this institution, European Friends of Armenia, really. I take this opportunity to appeal to this institution once again. So far, what you have done, really, it was not any helpful. Some of the Armenian lobby groups and diaspora groups are also represented in the ranks of this institution. Some of them are very aggressive. And really, what so far you have doing, it was not in a productive and effective. And you pushed Armenia to enmity with its neighbors. Try also to change your modus operandi and your approach. It's the same applies to Armenian some lobby groups in Brussels, in Paris, in Russia, in United States as well. Some of them, really, unfortunately, based on the uh, uh, you know a different or uh, completely unjustified historical narrative, and pushing Armenia for radical actions. We're also seeing some actions from their side for calling Armenia for a revanchism to reclaim the territories and so on. You know, it's enough is enough. You should also change your modus um, operandi. You should push Armenia to friendship to its neighbors and support in regional cooperation, regional initiatives. And I believe it's going to be a win-win situation. This institution also for so many years in social media insulted me as well on many occasions, but let's turn the page. You were bringing some corrupt politicians to Nagorno-Karabakh region as if you are supporting so-called independence of Nagorno-Karabakh. It was just one uh, sparing your own resources and as a result of which there was an, simply nothing. And Armenian people, as a result of which such, uh, you know, uh, enmity or hatred-based policy suffering as well. Now let's support and cooperation and peaceful development in the region. As regard to uh, 62 people, and I already explained, because they came on the territory and they actually penetrated the territory of Azerbaijan from Shirak region of Armenia. They're professional soldiers. They were trying to build a stronghold around Shusha city of Azerbaijan. They even brought heavy artillery. They killed five Azerbaijani uh, militaries and they killed our civilian officers. But you see, uh, uh, under the international humanitarian law, POW concept cannot be applied for them. In other words, they were a terrorist and are killing Azerbaijani civilians. And we have captured them and we are providing all uh, you know, necessary legal conditions for them, and legal proceedings are uh, taking place. But in the meantime, we are very open for communication. Uh, but once we are talking about the reconciliation, I will also raise another issue, because since the early 90s, we have uh, 4,000 missing Azerbaijanis. Unfortunately, in the course of these 30 years, we have never seen constructive engagement from Armenian side. ICRC also created a data bank of their relatives, in the experience of the Balkan conflicts, 
We always called Armenian side in our occupied territories, provide us safe access to the mass graves because there are a lot of civilians among these 4,000 people. So there was a no engagement at all. For let's say it's with humanitarian issue, international uh, humanitarian issues in general should be considered in a wider uh, you know concept uh, as well. But as regards to this institution, I already you know delivered my recommendation for your changing or adaptation to this new analysis as well. Otherwise, uh, the work of such institutions are going to be very counterproductive. Thank you. I think we have time for one last question. Um, it's very timely. It's about the new U.S. administration. It's from Radu Danu, and he's asking to what extent is Azerbaijan ready to engage with the new U.S. administration, and is Baku willing to, to bring closer Washington in building confidence around the Bono of Karabakh? Hmm. So the new U.S. administration and Biden-Harris administration, we are expecting from them what will be their priorities in the region of South Caucasus. Because uh, you know, it's said clear to everyone about Trump administration, uh, it was not South Caucasus in general was not in the priority of the Trump administration. Uh, but uh, we would like to see what will be first their uh, priorities and what will be the place of the South Caucasus on the agenda. And based on that, we can also build our own agenda. But true intentions and a stronger willingness from Azerbaijan side is on place. Because the United States was an important partner for Azerbaijan since the early days of the 90s, you know, since the independence of Azerbaijan, and the United States uh, contributed extensively to strengthening of Azerbaijan's independence and sovereignty. And independence and sovereignty of Azerbaijan also contributed to independence and sovereignty of our neighbors. But we have developed joint uh, projects. Uh, but in the context of Armenia-Azerbaijan conflict, the United States is a member of the OSC Minsk Group. Our expectation is also from the United States is to contribute to build of a better relations uh, between Armenia and Azerbaijan, support region-wise uh, cooperation, and new regional security architecture that's going to be built in the region of the uh, South Caucasus. Thank you very much, Hikmet. And with that, I would like to draw this meeting um, to a close. I would really like to thank you very much for joining us today uh, and engaging in such a frank and open conversation um, about the ongoing situation on the ground, your priorities, uh, prospects for the future, and the roles you see of various different international um, organizations along with the EU uh, and the US. Um, I found it very interesting. Um, EPC looks forward to continuing this conversation with you in the future. Um, also with uh, our friends from Armenia as well, we will continue to have a strong focus on the South Caucasus um, and hope that um, reconciliation and reconstruction um, will function and bring the South Caucasus you know back back as one um, one one group which is successful economic and politically for everybody to give all people in the region a much better and prosper prosperity in the future uh, so thank you very much for joining us again and, uh, and until the next time thank you thank you Amanda I can agree more with your last statement and also thank you for this opportunity to speak. And I also thank you all participants and followers and including for your uh, questions. APC was always platform for promoting peace, cooperation and reconciliation, including as a region of the South Caucasus. We also appreciate for so many years that you have contributed to all of these processes. But now, but once we have a peace in the region, finally, after the war, after the conflict, there are now new opportunities and uh, in the meantime, challenges as well. And we would like to see APC as a partner of the region once again. Thank you, Amanda, and your team. Thank you. Have a nice day. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone.